So you've pushed a button, you've launched a missile, it's traveling across land and sea. It finds its target and it eliminates it. That was my job in the US Navy. I wanted to kill the bad guys. That was my goal because I wanted to make our country a safer place. And I wanted to spread freedom and democracy throughout the world. But I stand before you today a different man. I no longer believe that violence is an acceptable solution. I refuse to push that button. And this is the story of my transformation. So as a young kid, I always wanted to be in the military. When I'd get my allowance, I'd go to the Army-Navy surplus store, and I'd buy a cool new uniform, put it on, and we'd go to the military air shows and parades. I looked up to our soldiers. For example, both my grandfathers fought in World War II. They made amazing sacrifices for our country, and I respected them. I wanted to be like them. Religion was also important to me growing up. Every Sunday, I'd go to church. I was part of our youth group, so I met weekly. My senior year, I met with my pastor. I told him I want to be in the Navy. And that it was 2003. September 11th had just happened. We were gearing up to invade Iraq. And I thought my country needed me, now more than ever. And my pastor says, this is awesome. This is exactly what Christians should be feeling right now. He tells me about his time in the Navy and how rewarding it was for him. But that, at the end of our conversation, he gets really serious all of a sudden. And he turns to me and he says, Michael, I just want you to know that the Navy is going to be a hard place for you as a Christian. You're going to hear a lot of cursing. I don't want you to fall into that temptation. So I leave home, go to the Naval Academy. Four years later, I graduate and I am commissioned as a submarine officer. This is what the inside of a submarine looks like. There's pipes hanging off the ceiling. There's valves and gauges everywhere. But when I first stepped on board, I noticed a smell. It smelled something like fried chicken. And I later learned that there's hot oil lubricating all of these machines, and people's hair and dead skin cells had fallen into that oil, creating that fried chicken smell. But the first job of every submarine officer is to operate the nuclear reactor. And let me tell you, it's a lot of fun. I personally converted five grams of uranium into pure energy. So me, as a 24-year-old, I was in charge of this enormously complicated, multi-billion dollar piece of machinery. I was also an important part of our national security strategy. This was my dream job, and it was pretty awesome. I'm still going to church at this time, and the Navy chaplains tell me I should read my Bible more because it will make me a better officer, and so I do. But I keep coming to these passages in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, love your enemy, and when they curse you, bless them, and when they attack you, do nice things to them. And I think, this is ridiculous. My job is to kill the bad guy, not to love them. And so I'm confused about what Jesus meant. And I ask myself, what have other Christians said? Well, the earliest Christians took Jesus literally. For example, Cyprian of Carthage, he said, Christians do not attack people who attack them because it is unlawful for the innocent to kill even the guilty. And he lived this out. During a time of intense persecution, Romans come into his house and chop his head off. Martin of Tours, he was an officer in the Roman cavalry. After he converts to Christianity, he walks up to his commanding officer and he says, I'm a soldier of Christ. It is not lawful for me to fight. There's hundreds of stories like this from the early church. And when I was reading these, I was shocked. I'd spent 24 years in the church my whole life and nobody had ever told me about this tradition of Christian pacifism. Today, what most churches teach is called just war theory. It was created by St. Augustine in the fifth century and later refined by Aquinas in the Middle Ages. And the basic idea is that a Christian can serve in the military as long as certain criteria are met. Things like, is the cause just? And are the means proportional to the actual threat? 
So I also ask myself, well, do I satisfy these conditions? And sadly, I had to say no. For example, the Navy right now is planning on purchasing 12 new submarines. These submarines, their only job is to launch nuclear weapons. The official estimate of their cost is $347 billion to build and maintain them. What else could we do with that amount of money? Well, tuition at UC Riverside is currently $13,000 a year, a little bit more. And if you do the math, that's over six million free college educations, but we're choosing to buy 12 submarines. There's nothing just about that, and our nuclear arsenal is already way out of proportion to any threat that we face. So now I have a conflict. On the one hand, I want more than anything to serve my country, but on the other, I need to respect what Jesus said. And so I go to my Navy chaplain, he says, Mike, I think you might be a conscientious objector. I have never heard of this before. So he shows me these two military regulations, Milpers Man 1900, Tax 020, and DOD Instruction 1300, Tax 06. They say a conscientious objector is someone who is opposed to participation in war in any form, whose opposition is based on religious training and or belief, and whose position is firm, fixed, sincere, and deeply held. Our country has a long history of conscientious objection. They come from every faith background. Most are Christians. Some are Muslim or Jewish, Hindu or Buddhist. Some are even atheist or agnostic. And they've done amazing things. In World War I, they got together and formed an ambulance unit. Then they went over to Europe and they helped the wounded soldiers and civilians from both sides of the conflict. In World War II, Millions of people are starving, dying just from famine, and the conscientious objectors say, how can we help? So they volunteer for a medical experiment. For six months, they subject themselves to famine conditions, eating half the amount of calories they need to survive. At the end of the experiment, doctors give them different diets to see which one brings them back up to full health. The results are then taken over to Europe to these people who are in famines and starving, and they're brought back to full health. In the Cold War, biological weapons are a huge threat to our country, and doctors are trying to develop new cures for these diseases, but they need to test them. So conscientious objectors step forward, and they say, I'll let you expose me to a biological weapon. Things like hepatitis, malaria, yellow fever, even the bubonic plague. I'll let you expose me to a biological weapon, and then we'll wait a couple days, and you'll give me the cure, and we'll see how well it actually worked. Today, around the world, conscientious objectors are deployed in war zones, working nonviolently to reduce the suffering caused by war. And so now I realize I can satisfy this conflict in myself. On the one hand, I can still serve my country, and on the other, I can still respect Jesus' commands by applying to be a conscientious objector. As you can see, these applications are extremely rare. There's over one million active duty service members right now. And in a given year, less than 100 people apply to be conscientious objectors. Of those that apply, about half are accepted. This is my application. It's 10 pages long. It took me about three months to prepare. Turning it in was the hardest thing I've ever done. I was giving up everything I'd worked my whole life for, my dream job. In here, I explain that I'm going to refuse to push that button. As a naval officer, that could send me to jail for years. I can't even explain the sort of emotional turmoil and confusion that that this document caused me. But I turn it into my captain, and he appoints three people, a chaplain, a psychologist, an investigating officer. Their job is to interview me, look at the evidence, and determine whether or not I'm a conscientious objector. My first application's denied. I apply again, 
that's also denied. With the help of the GI Rights Hotline and the ACLU, I apply, I send a petition to federal court. My legal record now is a thousand pages. It takes a year and a half, but I'm given an honorable discharge as a conscientious objector. And that's the story of my transformation. But I want to leave you guys with a challenge. President Kennedy once said that war will continue until that distant day when the conscientious objector enjoys the same reputation and prestige that the warrior does today. And so my challenge to you is that next time you're standing for the national anthem, I hope you're honoring our soldiers and the brave sacrifices they make. But my challenge is that you also remember the conscientious objectors who served in war zones and who gave their bodies for the same causes. Thank you.